my name's Lori. I'm a watercolor artist based out of Greensboro, North Carolina, and today I have partnered with Audrey from the Piedmont International Fellowship to bring their students a fun activity to try from home. Uh, the Piedmont International Fellowship, or PIF, is a local nonprofit organization that hosts events and activities for international, university, and college students in the Piedmont area of North Carolina. It's a really great program. It, you know, it gives students an opportunity to build community, to meet other people and other expats, and to create a sense of home away from home and also just to have fun stuff to do. Um, so I'm really excited to be a part of that today. Since COVID hit, that's looked a little bit different. Um, so we thought it would be fun to do an online thing today so we can create art from the comfort of our own homes. Um, so students, welcome. I am so glad you're here. Um, today we are going to be painting a watermelon. Um, it's a fun, easy, chill project to do from the comfort of your own home. Um, it's a great way to kind of get your feet wet with uh, watercolors as a medium, which is just so much fun. So grab your brush, grab your paint. If you signed up, you already have a kit delivered to your door, ready to go uh, with everything you need. All right, let's get started. Let's start off by going over our supplies. The first thing you need is paint and a palette. If you got our kit, you already have your paint in the palette. It's all dried up. It might be a little bit cracked, but once you add water to it, you won't be able to tell the difference. Today, we'll be using cerulean blue hue, permanent rose, and lemon yellow. Next, we'll be using two sheets of watercolor paper. One sheet is for your project. The other is a scrap piece of paper that you can use to test out your color mixtures, your techniques, and your water control. Watercolor paper is a lot thicker and sturdier than most of the other papers in your house. It's made that way so it can withstand the weight of the water and pigment. If you try to paint with watercolors on just any old paper, chances are it's gonna just tear to shreds. So make sure you're working with watercolor paper specifically. For this project, we will be using a round tipped brush. You will also need a glass of water and a paper towel or hand towel to dab your brush on. Okay, we are ready to go. This is our watermelon project that we're gonna be painting. We have a little watermelon slice here. We have a large semicircle right here and kind of the outside of a watermelon over there. Now before we begin anything and start painting, first we have to get our paints activated. Um, right now, yours are probably a little drier than mine, but the paint in your palette is going to be a little dry. See, I can touch mine there and it just kind of dents a little bit. Um, in order to get our paints activated and ready to go, we're just going to add, uh, get a little drop of water on your brush. Add one for each color. And let it sit. And that's going to moisten up the pigment. It's going to activate it and get it nice and ready to go for us today. Now, watercolors are a lot different than most paints that you typically think of when you think, oh, I'm going to paint something. Uh, most tubes in the art sections at stores will have, you know, oils and acrylics and, you know, large bottles or tubes, and they're ready to go and paint as soon as they come out. Watercolors are different. They come in a lot smaller tubes. Uh, this is the blue that we're using today, but I mean, this is only seven and a half milliliters, but with this little thing, and I still have some left over, I was able to fill up like 12 paint palettes with just a little glob, because that little glob is more than enough to paint multiple projects. Uh, for example, this is my largest tube of watercolor, and they don't really make them in you know sizes larger than this. Um, it's a 15 milliliter. I've been painting on this one with for like a year, and I've only used up that much, and I paint rather frequently. But all that to say, Watercolor isn't just the paint, it is the pigment in the paint plus water equals your color. So now that we've given this a few minutes to get ready for us and get kind of goop up so we can paint with it, let's dive in and sh I'll show you what I mean. I'm gonna dip my paintbrush in the water. I'm gonna wipe off the excess on the side of the thing or you can dab it on the paper towel, but I've just kind of covered my brush in more pigment than water on it right now. So, 
see that right there? It's a very pigmented color. It's very vibrant and deep, and it looks, you know, like the paint that's there. Now, with the paint still on your brush, we're gonna dip in the water, wipe off the excess, and paint again. See, that is a little bit lighter. It's a lighter color because we have less pigment and more water on our brush. Now, again, without completely rinsing a brush off, dip, wipe, again. And then that's a little bit lighter too. And I'm gonna go another time just for fun. And even once more. So there we have five different values. Value means how um, pigmented or not pigmented something is and in watercolors it comes out looking darker to lighter. This is just a very light version of that. We didn't add white to it. We didn't have to. We just added water. And because watercolors are transparent, that means you know you can't see through them, the white of the paper is showing up beneath between all the um, separated pigment. So that's how we get our color values. And we are going to be using this in just a few minutes. So let's try it again with our blue, just because we have plenty of paint and we can. I've rinsed my brush off. I'm gonna get a bunch of blue on my brush. I'm gonna rinse and wipe just once. Now magnesium blue hue is gonna come off of your brush a lot quicker. Um, and this one's kind of a milky color. You'll see that it's not quite as transparent as the others. It's got kind of a smooth like butter type thing going on. And that's totally fine. So we've done a couple of value changes. If you wanna practice again with your yellow, you can. It's harder for yellow to show up because it's already such a light color but you can go for it if you want. But we are going to move on to our main event project, which is the watermelon. Now, before we start um, actually painting it, we're gonna mix up some green. Some people like to mix as they go, but for the ease of it, we're gonna go ahead and mix our green. So we're gonna start with our yellow and get a lot of that and pull it into a different well on your palette. And by a lot of it, I mean we're just gonna mix a lot and you'll notice that it kind of beads up that's just the plastic I usually paint with a porcelain plate that's you know somebody gave me for my wedding that I don't really use um, and it doesn't do that don't let it bother you it's just doing its thing okay I'm gonna try and wipe off some of the excess And then I'm gonna get a little bit of blue. Like we just did a ton of yellow. Uh, let's start with a little bit of blue. Just because blue pigment stuff a lot. A little bit of blue goes a long way. And I'm gonna bring my scrap sheet of paper back and test and see if this is what I want. And you know what? I quite like that green, so we're going to go with it. I'm just wiping off the excess so I don't rinse it all off. Okay. Now I've noticed that my water is really, really yellow right now. And that's fine when I'm working with my yellows and blues, but we're about to dive into some pink and red and I don't want an orange watermelon, I want a pink one. So I'm going to pause, dump out my water, and get some more, and if your water's looking like this, I'd recommend you do the same. And we're back. Okay, so now we are going to start on our first piece of watermelon just this triangle and this 
doesn't your painting doesn't have to be laid out exactly like mine I've kind of have a little bit of quadrants going on that bleed into each other but you know do what you want that's fine all right I'm going to get a lot of pigment on my brush and I'm gonna start uh, not dead in the center but not not center-ish. And I'm going to draw a little triangle pointing up this way. And I'm gonna fill it in. The texture of this color is almost like gouache. All right, so that's the start. Now we're gonna do what we did when we were playing with our values earlier. We are going to dip our brush in water, wipe off the excess, and we're gonna follow the imaginary lines of this triangle out just a little bit further. And you can tweak the shape of your watermelon as you go. Dip, rinse, go a little bit further. And you'll notice I'm turning my paper as I'm painting. That's because usually I don't have a water glass right here, but I want it in frame so you guys can see what I'm doing with it. So dip, rinse. We're gonna pull it up a little bit further. This time I wanna give it a really good rinse because the stuff is super, super pigmented. And I want it to get a little bit light here up at the top. Okay. I think that's about as far as I want to go. I'm going to straighten up my edges. Just a personal preference. You don't have to. All right. There we go. And we can kind of see the transition that we've made from the dark at the tip to the lighter at the end. And now one last bit with a clean brush. I've rinsed it off. I've pulled the water off. I'm gonna dab it on my towel. Just one last little bit. Now we're going to drag a semicircle of just water across the top. And this is kind of drying, and I want to show you something here. Right here, what that pigment is doing, that's called a hard edge drying. Um, that's kind of just how watercolor goes sometimes with your pigment to water ratio. Sometimes it dries with just a little stripes or globs here and there. And that's kind of cool. This project is pretty loosey-goosey. It's not made to look super realistic. It's made to communicate the idea of a watermelon. Like it's not a realistic watermelon, it's just the idea of one. And that's freeing. But if you don't like a line like that, just get a wet brush uh, once it's mostly dried and just kind of scrub over it. Spread the pigments out a little bit. But if you like those blooms, it, it really does add kind of a neat texture. So keep it. All right. In the time that it took to explain that, my top edge has dried. So I'm going to go over with just a wide thing of water. We're not doing too much water, just enough to be there. Um, I know you can't really see it. Maybe you can see the glare, but it's just a semicircle. Now while that's still wet, I'm going to get my green and just along the edge. I don't want to touch the pink parts in case they're still wet. Just along the edge, I'm going to get and pull my green across. And I'm gonna bring it down just a bit too because I can. This technique is called wet on wet, which means you're putting wet watercolor on top of wet paper. Go figure, right? And I'm running out of room. I made my triangle pretty big, but that's okay. Um, but you'll notice that on wet on wet that the color just kind of spreads on its own. Back here, we kind of had to make sure we went over every inch, but here, 
you just put a little dab and it spreads out. The pigment is meeting the water and doing its thing, which is pretty cool. And you can get a lot of really cool, um, they call it blooms because the pigment just spreads out like a bloom. But it, it's really a cool effect and half of watercolor is just getting the water and the pigment to react in a cool way that you kind of might possibly have control over. All right, so we've got our base color down. While this is still wet, I wanna come in along the top with a darker bit. So I am going to get a little bit of blue. It's kind of drying back up again. And add it to what I have over in my green. And I don't think that's quite enough. There we go. And with the very tip of my brush, because I don't want to do a big old streak, I just want a little bit, I'm going to come along and just give it a touch. And it didn't bloom as much as I want, so I'm just going to go in with a clean, kind of damp brush and loop some water on there. I'm just touching it and it's creating the effect that I want. It's kind of a, a soft blend between the darker color and the lighter color. Now, one thing I do want to show you about these colors being so close together, thankfully this particular type of paint, that's Grumbacher's Academy, I believe, um, and this paper, uh, they dry pretty quickly. The water just zaps up, which is neat. But we do have to be careful about where these two spots meet because of color theory. Now, I'm sure you've seen a color wheel before, probably in a primary school, elementary school, but we have three primary colors that make up the rest of all of the colors ever. That's red, yellow, and blue. And of course you mix red and blue to make purple. And red and yellow for orange and we just did the green. And that's probably where most of our education stopped on primary colors. Other than opposites look really cool together. But colors that are opposite on the color wheel have another function because if you mix opposites you're going to get brown. And that's because when you mix red and green, for instance, which we'll do in just a second to show you, when you mix red and green, you're not just mixing red and green, you're mixing red with yellow and blue. And that's a lot of business going on. So, if we get our red, and we get our green and we put them like this if we leave a bit of separation they get along great they make each other pop because they're complementary but if we mix them back and forth like that and get them all up in each other's business I say that a lot I'm sorry guys look at that it's kind of a icky brown color, which, I mean, when you're painting with browns and earth tones, that's how you do it. When you're painting a vibrant watermelon, not so much, because we don't want rotten watermelon. That's kind of ick. So we're going to go in a different direction. But like I said, that's just something to be mindful of as you're doing this top, and we'll do it again in a few minutes when we come and do our rind over here. Next up is going to be our uh, outside circle watermelon. I just thought it'd be fun to, to try some of the brush techniques that we'll be using. So if, like me, your green is kaput, we're going to mix up a bunch of green. And I'm getting yellow in my blue, but that's okay because all of that blue is going to be used to make green anyway. We're no, we don't have blue standalone at any point.
All right, I'm gonna test my color. That'll do. All right, we are going to use this green. I'm gonna water it down just a bit so I get a nice translucent color. And again, use your scratch paper to, to see what you're doing. Yeah, there we go. So, I'm just gonna come in here and make a circle, and it, or oval, and it doesn't have to be perfect. It's just the first layer. And if you have color variations going on inside of it, that's fine too. I'm going to rinse again as I move inward just to kind of create a sense of shape with this thing. It's round, so I have kind of a highlighted section where there's the least amount of pigment. I started on the outside, um, kind of lightened my way in, kind of like we lightened our way up over here on this watermelon, but that give it, gives it the slightest idea of shape. Um, the difference between a circle and a sphere in art is just shadows and highlights. So that's our first step into creating that. And again, I've got some, you know, harder edges of the watercolor where it's blooming and drying and doing its thing in cool and funky ways. And since this is just a really loose project, I'm not gonna let myself bother, be bothered by that. And you shouldn't either. Okay, so we are gonna let that dry for a bit and we are gonna move on to our large half watermelon quarter watermelon we're going to move on to our larger quarter watermelon right here so we are going to again if you've used up your green make some more i still have some but i'm just going to be preemptive i'm trying to wipe as much pigment off of my brush uh, solely so I don't have to mix more green or make more water changes. But again, showing you all that stuff and doing the green right after the red has made my water brown. So I'm going to pause, refresh my water, and if your water looks anything like mine, you do that too, okay? All right, fresh water and I am back for business. So we are going to do our straight across watermelon, uh, straight edge, kind of the same way we did this. We're gonna start with our dark and work to our light. Not every watercolor artist will do that. Most things, if you're working in layers, you start with light and then you go dark. And that's fine, that's a really great technique, but right here we're doing something different. So we're going to get a little bit of water on our brush, but a lot more paint than water. And we are going to kind of plan where we want. I think I'm going to come around like this. And with the tip of my brush, I'm just going to paint a guideline. Now when I paint my guideline, I'm going to leave about this much space on either side um, for color blending and for our rind. So. Just up and down uh, to paint with the tip of your brush. Just hold your brush up and down like that as opposed to side like a pencil. Just up and down. Move from your elbow. And there we go. That's our guideline. And that's going to be the base. Everything else is just going to be imagined. You can draw it in with a pencil if you want. And that's fine. Or don't. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna have my brush down a little bit more. And we're gonna do what we did up here and in our warm up rinse and pull our color where we want it. Rinse and pull. And this one, because it's such a larger space. It might take a little bit longer for you to get the pigment where you want it to go. If you find that it's too dark over here and it's not light enough over here, go back here and just kind of swoosh. 
Maybe add a little more pigment. And do it again. But you don't have to do that if you don't want to. Okay, I think this is, and I know I say this every time, this might be about where I want to stop with myself. Which of course means I'm going to go one more. I'm just gonna fiddle around with my placement of the pigments. I don't want it to be too dark down here and too light up here. I want it to be kind of gradual. And when it's too light and on the outer edges and the outer edges come in closer, it just looks unripe. Now that's never stopped my toddlers from eating an unripe watermelon. They do not care. But this is my watermelon and I want it to be a little pinky. Okay, that's good enough for me. I'm gonna rinse my brush off completely. Now, um, my edge right here is a little puddly, so I'm gonna give that a minute to get a little bit drier. Again, because I, when I put in my green for the rind, I don't want it to be so wet that my color, my green, rushes from the water I put down into the water down here to create that, you know, very lovely, interesting brown color. I, I would like to avoid that. So we'll take a, take a break, and it's not gonna be very long. While I'm waiting for this edge to dry just a smidge, I would like to show you how to get rid of stray marks on your paper. Now, as you're painting, you might have, you know, a splatter that you don't like, or maybe like a mark that isn't where you want it to be. Um, the cool thing about watercolor is that this is not permanent necessarily. First thing you're gonna need to do to correct that problem is to rinse out your brush real good, ideally in clean water, but this is what I have. Um, get your brush wet, not dripping, but you know, wet, damp, and we're gonna go over that spot with our wet brush and kind of do a scooping motion with it. Now see that spread out that pink drop a little bit. So I'm gonna rinse, I'm gonna dab it on my paper towel, and I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna do it again. And that looks a lot better. And you can keep doing that until it looks mostly done. Now some pigments are going to be more staining than others and that's exactly what it sounds like. It stains the paper a little bit and there's only so much you can get it up. I think we have about reached that point with that little drop there. But, you know, just a very light pink smudge is much better than a very dark pink red blob. This is less noticeable, especially from across the room this is gonna stick out. All right, so I think through that explanation, we have dried up enough over here. I'm gonna come in with a wet but not sopping wet paintbrush and just draw kind of a maybe centimeter and a half width band of water semicircled around of where I want my rind to be. And again, I'm painting bigger than I have paper for, but you know what? It's better than having teeny tiny things. All right, so I've got my water working quickly so I can get pretty blooms. We're gonna get a nice Thick thing, and you see how those edges are just really soft. The water kind of diffuses them from their intensity a bit on the edge. That's pretty cool. Just letting the watercolor and the pigment do what it wants to do. Okay, so I have my outside edge. 
I'm going to go ahead, darken that green, blue it up a little bit more. And I'm going to come in on the outer edge. And that line's a little harder than I want it. So I'm gonna rinse my brush. Wipe off the excess. I'll just soften it a little bit. Just drag that dampish brush across to blend the colors together. And I'm gonna do it again with where my lighter green is, just to soften it a little bit more. There we go. That is done. Now we're gonna now we're gonna move on to our second layer up here. Now this paint on this paper has been drying fairly quickly, but just in case, let's check for dampness. Now this one it it's harder and easier than you think. Usually, you know, if you for instance over here is still wet because I can see the glare of the water that is obviously wet and I do hope that's showing up on camera but sometimes watercolor is wet when it doesn't even look wet if you touch it and it feels noticeably cold it's still damp if you touch it and it feels you know pretty much the same temperature as right next to it then it's dry enough and even if there will be a little bit of a temperature variation if it's noticeable, like super noticeable, give it another minute. If it's you know, about the same, you know, go for it. We are going to, on top of this one, be coming in and doing these uh, gloopy texture lines. Um, and those are really fun to do uh, because we get to use some really cool brush technique to do it. So we're gonna get a green going on here that's more blue than yellow. Not totally blue, but not totally yellow either. And what happens if I add a little bit of purple? Okay, yeah, not purple, red. And that kind of desaturates it a little bit. That's another fun thing about color theory, is if I want green to not be so vibrant, you just add just a teeny bit of red and it doesn't make it totally brown, it just makes it a little less bright. Now, before we go in and do our gloops, I wanna talk about a couple of things. First is where we're gonna put it. If we have an oval, and I'm gonna have these side by side, and the lines, if we put them straight across, that doesn't look like a watermelon, that looks like a burger patty. However, since we've already kind of created the idea of a shape with how we colored in the circle or the oval, we're going to continue that on top. And again, even though this is a very loose painting, we want whoever looks at it to know when they look at it, oh, that's not a blob with other blobs or a burger patty and green. It looks like it might possibly be a watermelon. So to do that, we're going to create round lines that come out with increasing roundness. I mean, that's a terrible example, but just having those round lines creates the idea of round shape. So we're going to go with that. Now the next thing about how we create these lines, we're not, we could go about this one of two ways to create these little, you know, roundy shapes. And we could uh, use the tip of our brush, draw little ovals right next to each other, 
and fill them in as we go and that's fine. I've done projects and you can check on my YouTube the jellyfish project. We use that kind of a little shape to create the flow and feel of jellyfish tentacles. But for this project it's going to be a lot easier if we just press down and lift and press and lift. And by press I mean put more pressure on your brush. So instead of just the tip touching it's much more contact with the bristles on the paper. It creates a thicker line and play around on your scrap sheet of paper of just how thick you want to make that and just what all your brush can do. But when you're done with that, we're gonna come back and we're gonna do that on our things. I'm gonna start with my middle lines. I'm not gonna go straight across, you can if you want, but I feel like that kinda straight lines in nature don't typically um, communicate the organic liveliness of it. So we're going to press and kind of circle around and come back up at the top. some more. Because I used so much of my explanation. A little more blue, I think. Y'all thought you are going to be painting and most of the time it's just going to be spent mixing blues and greens. All right, now as I come on to this edge, uh, we are going to do just little half things. And we'll smooth it out. Because watermelons aren't gourds, their edges aren't raised on the side, they're smooth. So we're gonna try and keep up with that texture. And just play around with how to do that. And the easiest ways is just to do your line and then come on top of it and gently change the shape at the edge of it where it meets the paper to be smooth. Okay, now I'm gonna come over on this side and do the same thing. And I think just for fun, and I haven't tried this, but we might as well give it a go. I might just come and do with a very, you know, got my green, rinsed it off. This is drying so I can kind of come along inside of it with this lighter color. And just put little touches of extra texture because I didn't like how stark that contrast was with just this lighter color of texture. It kind of blends that a little bit better, but it keeps with the general shape of what I'm doing. All right, outer watermelon, done. All right, now we're gonna come in and do our seeds on our watermelons. So again, check your paper, just make sure your watermelons are, you know, not wet anymore. They shouldn't be, but if they are, give it another minute or so. Now we're gonna grab our fine tip Sharpie and we're gonna draw in some little seeds. And most of the seeds are gonna be teardrop shaped. And I'm gonna fill them in mostly. I think I'm gonna leave a little bit of a sliver to kind of show a little bit of color and gleam. Sometimes with this project, I will include a white gel pen um, when the budget is there for it. I think 
this time it's not because those can easily eat up half of the kit's value. But I'm just going to spread them out. And go all over. Make them about the same size. Maybe, you know, have half a seed in there. Just generally do what you want. They typically radiate from the center a little bit, like a starburst pattern. So most of the tips of mine are going to be pointed down, but I mean, do make sure these are pretty haphazard. They're not going to be, you know, in straight lines all the way across. They're going to, you know, nature is organic and growing and moving and slightly different wherever it goes. All right. Now I'm going to do the same thing on this skin. i got to be careful not to put my hand in that watermelon because it is still wet. So because the seeds kind of go in a starburst pattern. I'm going to start in the center. Let's just uh, kind of my three flagship ones, and we're going to go out from there. And maybe this is just half a seed. And if at any point you have a little blob on your watermelon or like an extra speck of color that you don't like, like uh, right here I have a little bit of a hard water bloom. And it's cool. I kind of like the texture. But if you don't like something like that, stick a seed on it. And I'm losing my starburst shape, so I'm going to... Try and get that back just a little bit. Now I think I'll fill them in on this one just so I can show you what you can do with a white gel pen if you happen to have one around. I'm going to do another little half a seed over there. And I'm going to spread them out the farther I get from the center. Maybe just a little doodad up there. Mm, yeah, that'll work. Cool. Now I call that done. If you happen to want to go over it with a white gel pen to add a little bit of gleam on the seats, that's fine too. I left spaces on these seeds. I didn't color them all the way in solid, so that might not need one, but I told you I'd show you how to do it over here. We're just going to come with white gel pen and do a little line, a little tap for the little ones. Just a smidge of, smidge of white. You don't have to do it on all of them. You can if you want. It's your painting. You can paint it how you want. I like the pop that that adds. But for all intents and purposes, we've done it. Congratulations. Now one little tip I will tell you. Um, when you are sitting up close to your painting and you've been working on it and you've been staring at it for like 30 minutes, you don't have a good perspective. So if you're looking at what you've painted and you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is so globby. I don't like any of how this is going. First off, don't be so hard on yourself. It's a watermelon. It's just a painting. It's a fun thing to do. Second, I want you, when it's dry, to go prop it up somewhere in your home and then step back all the way across the room and look at it. It always looks better when you kind of step back. And if you don't like it when you take a step back, leave it there. Look at it in the morning. Again, we weren't going for a realistic watermelon. We're going for the idea of a watermelon. I guarantee you that each and every one of you is going to paint a slightly different watermelon. 
is not going to look exactly like mine. The color is going to bloom in different places. The value is going to look different. The way the water moved on the rind is going to be different. And the way you did your little um, splotches are going to be different. And that's cool because nature does that. It's on its own. All right, that's it. You did it. Congratulations. I hope you had as much fun as I did painting along today. Um, I would always love to see what you guys have created. Uh, so if you post over on Instagram, hit me up, uh, tag me. Uh, my handle is at etaylor.creates, and that'll be in the description link below, of course. Or use hashtag PIF paint along, and you can see what all your other friends have created too. To learn more about the Piedmont International Fellowship, check the description in the box below. And yeah, that's it. Have a great one, guys.